All right. Hey, uh, we are continuing this series, How Not to Read the Bible. I've been having fun, um, so hopefully you have. <laughs> uh, one of the things I've, I didn't really realize, because I knew this about myself, but this, this series has reinforced it, um, is I, 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 maybe I have a problem, but I just kind of like to stir stuff up. Like, <laughs> I like to say things that I know people will be like, did he really? I don't, I don't know about that. And not like in a malicious kind of way, I don't think. Maybe there's a, maybe a little bit of that. Uh, but mostly, like, I love having conversations that make us think that make us like rethink and reexamine. Okay, what? Why do I hold the beliefs that I hold? Like, have I ever, ever questioned that? Have I ever asked those questions? Have I thought about a different angle? And so I love being able to do that. And I, I love that we have the kind of church that's like, yeah, bring it on. Let's go. Let's do these kind of things because uh, we think that like within the, the pages of this literary work, I'm not going to call it a book because if you were here first the first week, it's not a book. It's a library. There's lots of books, right? But we think it reveals who we are as humans and who God is and what the problem is and what the solution is. And so it's like I, I love challenging us uh, on this and kind of stirring some stuff up. And I think today might do that as well. So here we go. We're going to ask the question, um, are, are, is the Bible and science at odds? Like, is the Bible anti-science? What do we do with the natural world around us and what science tell us about the natural world? Then we open up the pages of Scripture. Can those two things get along? Um, because the kind of popular notion is, no, they can't. Uh, and this comes from both sides of, of the debate. We hear things like, you know, you're either a person of science or you're a person of faith. You either trust reason and facts and logic, or you're like, you know, fairy tales and myth and that, that religion stuff. Um, oftentimes when surveys are done and asked, you know, what's your biggest objection to faith? One of the most common, or yeah, most common responses, especially of like younger generations, millennials, Gen Z, uh, is that, you know, I, the, the science disproves faith or disproves the Bible, or I can't make those two things get along. Uh, and on the other side of that, it's not just people on the outside of faith looking in. I know lots of people who are Christians who are automatically skeptical of anything that even smells a little bit like science. They're like, no, because the Bible. And it's like, wait, 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 wait. Does it have to be like that? Is that actually true? Or can the two uh, get along? I'm, I'm going to, spoiler alert, I think they can, right? Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about what that looks like. And for the purpose of our discussion today, um, we are going to kind of zone in on just one particular thing. There are a lot of conversations that could be had about, hey, when I go about my life and I'm, I'm engaging with science and faith and the world around me, how do those things work? And what about these passages? A lot of different things that we could talk about. Uh, in fact, like this whole series, you are probably going to leave today saying, well, he didn't say this and he didn't talk about that and he didn't answer that question and I still wonder about this. That's okay. That's kind of the point. The point isn't to give us all the answers, but to give us tools to go and find some of the answers uh, ourselves and to go on a lifetime journey of learning uh, and diving in. And so we're only going to talk about one thing. We're barely going to scratch the surface, but I think it's something that sets everything else up. It's kind of foundational. It's the first thing that comes to mind when people start asking about questions about uh, the Bible uh, and science, and that is the idea of creation. How did this get here, okay? Not the building that we're standing in, because there's a very clear, we can, we can figure that out. But like the, the, the world that we live in, the, like the creation, the cosmos, the universe, like the physical place and the physical things that we see, how do we square that with Scripture? How do we square what's, with uh, what science says about that versus with what Scripture says about that? What is the creation account? What does it have to say? And so the creation account traditionally would be considered Genesis 1-1, the first pages of Scripture, uh, through Genesis 2, verse 3, through day 7, where God rests. And so God, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty. God's spirit is hovering over the surface of the deep. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And he separates the light and the day. That's day one. And day two, he separates the waters above and the waters below and puts this kind of sky thing in there. And then day three, the dry land appears. And day four, the sun, moon, and stars uh, pop up. And uh, day five, the, the birds and the fish. And day six, the land animals and people. And day seven, God rests. How do we make sense of that? with how we now understand the way the world works and functions. And so here's what I want to do. It's kind of going to be fire hydrant like at the beginning, all right? It's just going to be like information, blah, and then we're going to get to the end and just kind of kind of land this plane on something that's a little bit more practical. And so what I want to look at is different Christian views of creation. So Genesis, what we just talked about, Genesis 1-1 through 2-3, this creation account, this creation narrative, how have Christians historically understood that? Uh, and some of you are like mind blown already because you're like, there's more than one way to understand that. There's more than one way to read that. There is, in fact, through, through the centuries, through the generations, all throughout Christian history, like Jesus loving, Bible believing, like hold the scriptures in very high authority, um, believe it as authority for the life and inspired by God and all those things have disagreed on how to understand the first page or the first two pages of the Bible. So I want to look at a few broad categories of what these have been. 
and there's a lot more, and there's a lot more that fit underneath of these, and then we'll kind of uh, whittle it down and drive some application towards the end. It's important to know right from the beginning, again, all of these, all of these views fit within what's called orthodox Christian belief. Orthodox meaning right belief. Um, and so that would be from the moment that the church started 2,000 years ago after the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus and this movement began all the way up until now, there are certain things that's like, yes, Christians believe these things. And if you believe these things, you fit within orthodoxy. If you believe something outside of these things, you've now stepped out of what is traditionally known as Christianity. So all of these views fit within this orthodox statement, the first line of the Apostles' Creed, if you're familiar with that. We believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. All of these fit within that. So we good? Good? Ready for me to turn the fire hydrant on? Okay, here it comes. Uh, <laughs> view number one, young earth creationism. Uh, young earth creationism is a uh, what we would probably call the most literal reading of Genesis 1. Young earth creationists read Genesis 1 in the six days of creation as six literal 24-hour periods, consecutive 24-hour periods, and then we'll take that um, and read uh, the genealogies that are within the scripture and the different listings of generations and the ages. They'll do a little math, add all those up, and say the earth is somewhere between six and 10,000 years old, and that is literal. That is kind of a very broad, surface-level, young earth creationist perspective. Okay, I know there's a lot more nuance if you're familiar with that position. Um, and I will say, they have a different way of seeing science. And there are very, many very, very intelligent people that fall into this category. Um, and so it's not just like, well, you must be dumb if you think that. No, nope. lots of people have believed this and continue to believe this. The second view would be uh, something that's called appearance of age. So this is kind of a subset of young earth creationism that would believe that God created the world six literal days, but he created it with the appearance of age. Uh, and so the reason like when we see things and we do testing, it's like the earth is 13.8 billion, is that the right number? I think it's the right number. It sounds right in my head. Where's my science teacher? Yes, okay, she's nodding her head, good. <laughs> 13.8 billion, they say, well, it's actually, it's young, but God made it with the appearance of age. So things that, that were on day one actually already looked old. That's that perspective. We have the perspective that's called the gap theory. And the gap theory, uh, there's different variations of this, but they read verses one and two of Genesis one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, period. And then there's a gap before verse two, and now the earth was formless and empty. But there's a gap in time there. It could be millions of years, it could be billions of years, but there is a, a wide gap between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2, and creatures could be living, they could be created, they could be evolved during that time, and then when creation begins, there's like a recreating or a reordering or forming to make the creation a place for life to flourish. That's the gap theory. Position number four, we have what's called old earth creationism or the day age theory. Uh, this would hold that God created, but still the earth is very, very old. Uh, people who hold this view would generally uh, turn to the, the Hebrew word for day in Genesis 1 is the Hebrew word yom. And yom can mean a day or it can also mean an age or an epoch. Uh, and so we, we see it translated this way as other place in the Old Testament, specifically that Hebrew word like the day of the Lord is an age in the future that is to come. It's not literally like, hey, the day of the Lord. It's like March 22nd in the year 3,123. Like that's the day of the Lord. It's like, no, it's, a, it's this future date, an age that is to come. Uh, or Old Testament will talk about in the days of the king, same kind of idea. It's an age that is there. So people that hold to this view would say, hey, the, the six days in Genesis are six ages or eras or epochs. And again, we don't know how long they are. All right. Number five, evolutionary creationism, or sometimes called theistic evolution. Uh, there are actually followers of Jesus, and again, some of you may be shocked by this. They're like, There's, there are followers of Jesus that believe in the theory of evolution. And some of you are like, it's actually me, and I've never said anything because I didn't want people to judge me, right? Because it's people are like, what? You can't. Okay, anyway, it's a different thing, right? There are followers of Jesus who love the scriptures, who hold this thing as the authority of their life, and yet believe in the theory of evolution. And here's how they do that. They'll read the text and say, this doesn't seem to be the text of scripture. This doesn't seem to be talking about the physical processes by which the earth came into existence. It tells us that God created, but it doesn't tell us how. And so we can rely on the best of what science can show us. And it's the theory that we have now. We may have a different theory in the future, but we can rely on science to tell us the how behind that. And so evolutionary creationism, there's, again, there's nuance within these perspectives, would say that it's not completely on its own. It's not atheistic evolution, but God is involved in it, that, that he is guiding the process along, that he's helping fill the gaps where they exist. Uh, and it's a process that he set up. And finally, number six, 
Number six, ancient cosmology or a temple text. An ancient cosmology or a temple text. Now, I'm going to spend a little more time on this one because I'm just going to put my cards on the table. Number six is currently where I land. And I say currently because I hold this with an open hand. Uh, I have not always held this position. In fact, I kind of grew up with a faith tradition that said, if you do not believe in young earth creationism, you're basically not even a Christian. You might as well pack it in and go home. Um, but, you know, I, after you know, reading and studying the scriptures and some of the, the commentary around this, right now I'm in category six. And you could can, you can maybe persuade me or, or uh, like, hey, Phil, have you thought about this? We could have some interesting conversation. But ancient cosmology or temple text um, would hold to the view that the scripture actually has nothing to say about the physical processes by which the earth came into existence. God created it, but how? Uh-huh. And how long it took? Uh-huh. That Genesis 1 is telling a different story. Uh, the Genesis 1 primarily is speaking about functional creation rather than physical creation. How the world functions, not does it exist or not. And that's based upon the wording uh, that is found in uh, the text itself and the, the verbs that are used. It's also based upon the uh, kind of the ancient Near Eastern context in which the Hebrew Bible was developed. Uh, So this is written by and for to the nation of ancient Israel thousands of years ago. We know that they have neighbors. We have the ancient, uh, the Egyptians and the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Canaanites, uh, and we have writings of theirs, and we see common themes in how the ancient people understood the world, Um, and they have much more of a functional view of creation. If you want to go deeper into this perspective, if you think that sounds interesting, I would recommend The Lost World of Genesis 1. Uh, It's a book by Dr. John Walton, who's a professor of Old Testament at Wheaton College. Very good book. Um, he has this really good way of putting this example of it's the difference between a house and a home. That we can talk about the creation of a house and we can talk about well, they dug the foundation, they poured the footers and you know, the walls went up and we got the sheathing on the outside and we ran the utilities and you're talking about the creation of the house or you can talk about when you bought that house and you walked in you said, we're going to make this the living room. We're going to make this a bedroom. This is going to be my office. You're not actually making anything but you're ordering it to set up a home that you're going to live in that's for you and your family. And so this reading of Genesis would say, the creation account is about God creating a world that can be a home for humans to live and flourish in. And also, it ends up being the home where God will dwell and live with his people. That it reads like an ancient temple text. Again, in the ancient Near Eastern context, we have this theme that that kind of develops where uh, ancient peoples would build a temple to their God. There would be a seven-day dedication period And at the end of that time, that God's presence would come into the temple. And so the Genesis account reads very much like that as well. There's six days of God ordering and God bringing things about. On the seventh day, he rests. He comes to live within what he has made and dwell with his people. We see passages in the Old Testament that says, hey, the, the heavens are God's throne and the earth is his footstool, that the whole earth is full of his glory. In the New Testament, this idea is picked up that God does not live in human, like temples built by human hands, but he's everywhere. He, he inhabits this whole creation. We see in the Old Testament also the pattern of the temple being built. It takes King Solomon seven years to build the temple. After it's built, there's a seven-day dedication period, and on the seventh day, the presence of God comes into the temple. There's imagery that's used, and again, this is one of these weird things. If you're reading through the Old Testament, you get to the instructions for the tabernacle that later carry on to the temple, and it's like, use this much gold and this kind of acacia wood and this kind of linen, and and it's like all this ornate, but it actually reflects what Eden looked like or the description that's given there, the temple that God would come to dwell in. Okay, I want to kind of turn off the fire hose for a second. Is everybody still with me, or are you ready to go to sleep? Because you're like, that was a lot. That was a lot. This feels more like a lecture, not a sermon. And I know, I, I get it. I, I get it. Um, here, here's, again, here's the main thing that I want you to hear. All of these, all of these fit within Orthodox Christian belief. You, you, can, you can firmly hold any one of these and say, you know what? I love and follow Jesus, and I am trying to understand the scriptures to the best of my ability, and I'm trying to hold this as the authority over my life, and I believe this is inspired by God to reveal who he is and point me to life, and I land in anywhere between one through six or a combination thereof. And you can hold one of those like firmly and be like, Phil, I want to debate you after the service. That's great, but not after the service because I want to talk to people and say hi, okay? Different time. But like, you, we can talk about that, or you can be like, this really isn't that interesting to me. And you can, you can be a person who, again, maybe you, you, you come across a an article at one time or, uh, you know, someone engages you in a classroom setting and you're like, oh no, where's my faith at? But you don't have to go, my faith falls apart because, oh, okay, that can fit. That can fit. And let me just say, if you're a person who, who's like, I'm, I'm not really sure where I am with faith, I'm trying to figure this out, I'm not sure what I believe, 
I, I really what I want for you is not to convince you of anything, but just to say you're not locked into one option, that science doesn't have to be an obstacle to you following Jesus. This is something that we hold with an open hand, which is also why, by the way, our church does not have an official view. Like, it's not going to be like, hey, here's our statements of belief. This is what we believe about, you know, the, you know, the, the nature of God and the nature of humans and the scripture. And, oh, by the way, we have this perspective about uh, creation. We would say, no, it's, we hold that with an open hand. We love having honest dialogue and conversation about those things. So, with all that said, that was all my introduction. You guys ready for another hour? <laughs> Just kidding, I won't do that. You may not believe it, but I actually do have a clock in the back that's like ticking down, and I'm, I'm very aware of it. <laughs> With all that said, there are some things about the creation narrative that I say are absolutely essential, that regardless of where we fall, there are things that are true that communicate deeper truths than just our theory about how the world came into existence. And so I want to pull that idea out and, and, and talk about that for a little bit by just looking at the first two verses of Genesis. Originally, I wanted to go all the way through the whole first chapter, but that wasn't happening. So Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning. We're going to get a little, a little nerdy. We're going to talk about some, some Hebrew words, um, but they bring this to light. Uh, the, the word that's used for the phrase, in the beginning, you know, for the way that we think about things as modern people in our English language, beginning is a very, like, finite point in history. It's like there was the beginning and there was nothing before the beginning. It's like a date that I can, I can pinpoint. There are other Hebrew words that can be used to describe that kind of point in time. That's not the word that's used here. The word that's used here is the word reshit, and it means an unspecified point of time in the past. It's our English equivalent of saying, you know, way back when, back in the day, a long time ago. All right? So it's, so it's like, hey, a long time ago when? doesn't matter. A long time ago, God created. The word for created is the Hebrew bara. And it can be used to talk about physical creation. It can also be used to talk about giving something function or purpose. But what's unique about the word bara is it is a word that is only ever used for something that God does. There's another word for making things that can be used for something that humans do. But this is, there's something different that's happening here that's something that only God does. So a long time ago, God did something unique to bring about the world that we know. And he created two categories that are mentioned here, the heavens and the earth. I love doing this and putting ourselves like kind of a thought experiment uh, to transport ourselves back in time to be an ancient Israelite. So we're living thousands of years ago. We don't have any kind of scientific method that we have now. There's no telescopes. There's no microscopes. We don't have understanding of that thing. And so when I say the heavens, the only thing that I can observe is what I can see with my eyes. And so I would, I would ask you to look up and see what you see, but you're going to see a ceiling in here. But if you're standing outside and you look up, what are you going to see? Just, it's kind of gray today, but you're going to see blue sky on a nice day. If you look up at night, what you're going to see is a, is a, is a sky full of stars. And to the ancient people, that, all of that up there, it's just, it's just the heavens. The sky that I see, and, and there was a, a spiritual aspect to that as well, where, yeah, everything up there, that's the heavens, and that's also like the spiritual realm. That's God's space up there. Because I'm a human, and I, I, I have no way of getting up there. I have no way of seeing what that is. Oh, my goodness, what are those lights that are up there? Are those like angels or some sort of gods or something? This is how the ancient people perceived the heavens and the skies above. So look up at everything that you see. God created it. Now look, he created the earth as well. Now when we think of the word earth, probably the first thing you thought of is like a blue ball floating in space. It's a globe. Uh, way back in the day, there was like a documentary PBS series maybe with Carl Sagan, a pale blue dot. I don't know if some of you are old enough to remember that. But we have this picture, and this, blows, this blew my mind when I heard this. Do you know how long humans have had, been able to conceptualize that image? 1972. Some of you were actually alive. <laughs> that was not a shot, okay? I'm just saying. It's a statement of fact, you know? Ray Sheep, way back when. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> the, the first image, I think, came out in the 60s, but it was black and white, and it was grainy, but it was 1972 that we got the first image of this blue ball floating in space. It was way, way, way past when the ancient Israelites, when they, when they, when they heard the word earth, it was just, okay, if I look up and I see the heavens... Look down, the earth is just everything below me. It's this, this place that I ex exist in. The earth was human space. If, if the heavens are like the spiritual realm, the earth is, the, is where humans are. So way back in the day, God did something unique to bring about everything up there, everything down there, everything in the spiritual realm, everything in the physical world that we exist in. It's a statement of inclusion. It's all-encompassing. 
to the ancient people, they had no understanding of our modern categories, but they would have understand that well. I want to read a quote from the book that the series is based on, from Dan Kimball. He says this about verse 1 here. When we also need to remember that God was not trying to communicate modern scientific principles. He wasn't providing a textbook on the physics of the solar system, on the age of the earth, on how the gravitational pull of the sun holds the earth in motion, the subatomic details of the Big Bang theory, or anything that addresses our typical scientific questions about our origins. He was simply telling the Israelites that all they could see and what they knew had been made by him. Verse 1, Israel, just so you know, I've, I've done all this. I've made all of this. I am the God behind the world that you see. Verse 2, and now the earth was formless and empty. And darkness covered the surface of the watery depths, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Formless and empty is a key phrase here. It's actually a little rhyme. There's two words put together in the Hebrew, tohu vavohu. Tohu vavohu. And it means like a, a, a wild like wasteland. It's a wilderness. It's a place that humans can't survive. It's desolate. Um, the other time that this is used is actually used in the context of where Israel is when this scripture comes to them. And so the nation of Israel at this time is, has they've left 400 years of slavery in Egypt. They're on the way to the promised land, and they're going to spend 40 years wandering in the wilderness. The first five books of scripture, the Pentateuch, are attributed to Moses, and he is getting it and writing it during this time, during this wilderness wanderings. And so this idea of tohu vavohu is also used to describe the area outside of Israel's camp. And so that area of the world going from Egypt to the promised land, it is hot, it is dry, it is desert. You will die out there. And so the area outside of camp is it's a wild wasteland. And here, the watery depths of the uncreated world are a wild wasteland. It's like, wait, how can it be hot and desert and watery depths at the same time? We're not talking about something physical. We're talking about an idea being communicated that it was not able to support human life. This was not a place where humans could flourish and live and survive. It was formless. It was empty. It was a wasteland. And darkness, a couple more words here, darkness covered the surface of the watery depths. To the ancient peoples, darkness and water were familiar images, very familiar for Israel, that, that represented chaos and disorder. Chaos and disorder. Uh, in, in fact, they're, they're, again, places that humans didn't want to be. They couldn't survive. And if you read through the scriptures, start paying attention to all of the places, specifically, specifically through the Old Testament in Israel's journey with God. But there's story after story of God delivering his people through waters here in Genesis 1, and then we have the flood narrative, and then we have the, the parting of the Red Sea, and then we have them going into the promised land, coming through the Jordan River, and then you have the, the time of the exile where the armies of the Assyrians and the Babylonians are described as raging rivers and waters that are flooding the land into the New Testament, the, the symbol of baptism, and all the way in Revelation, it's at the end of time when Christ returns, he says, there'll be no more sea. And you're like, what's God's problem with dolphins, man? They're cute. It's like, it's not, it's not a statement on marine biology. It's this idea of when all things are set right, chaos and disorder will be no more. That there's account after account of, of God saying, I will lead my people through the darkness and the disorder and the chaos, and on the other side, there is life. And so we have this imagery that is all throughout the scriptures. It's an image that's also all throughout um, ancient Near Eastern uh, mythologies, creation mythologies. Again, the Canaanites, the Babylonians, the, the Egyptians, one of the common themes is like battles of the gods, that they would battle against one another and the resulting battle would bring about chaos and disorder or sometimes the gods that were battling, one of the gods would be the chaos god or the chaos monster. Um, one example is in the Enuma Elish, which is the, kind of the Babylonian creation story and their god Marduk defeats the god of chaos whose name is Tiamat and Tiamat is portrayed as this, this dragon type serpent which is a creature of chaos. She's also known as the, sea, uh, the, the, the god of like the salt waters. And so there's this idea of the gods battling and chaos being unleashed. That was what was known in the world around Israel. But here's what's being communicated to Israel. That their God is not threatened by the chaos. He's not in a battle against the chaos. It's chaos and it's watery and it's unknown, but he's, he's just there hovering. He's in control. He's over it. The word that's used for hovering is, is also a word that is, it, it means to hover, to protect. It's, it's used elsewhere to describe the way a, a mother eagle hovers over her nest and watches over and provides for her young. 
And so there's this image being given to Israel. It's like, hey, you know that the stories of the nations around you, and there's the chaos, and, and there's these rival gods. Just know that your God has no rival. And even from the beginning, he was there hovering, protecting, providing. He was there with you in the chaos, bringing you through it, and preparing a place for you. It's in stark contrast to the, the, con- to the, the context and the, the peoples around them. Unlike the gods of the nation, theirs is the one true God. He has no rival. And not only has he created, but he loves what he has created. He protects what he has created. He, he, he is with and dwells in his creation with his people. I would argue that these first two verses set up the understanding of the rest of the creation narrative. That regardless of any of the first, you know, the six uh, theories that we fall into, like this understanding is key in all of them. That this is about the nature of who is this God and what has he done and what is this world like, like big ideas that are being communicated. That the primary message of Genesis, the primary message of Genesis 1 is about who, not how. And it's about why, not when. It's about who. It's about saying, okay, who is this God and what is he like and what is his character? What His character has been revealed through what he has done and who are we in light of who he is? Who is this about and why? Why did he create? Why are we here? Why does something exist? It's about who, not how, and why, not when. And that, when we, when we understand that, like when we read it in that way, I would argue that this communicates things that are deeper than just the questions that we want to ask as modern people. And when we understand from the beginning, like this, is, this is about who is this God and, and where do we fit in this story and, and how then should we live in light of that, it understands deep truths that speaks to every generation from the ancient Israelites all the way till today, regardless of what science has said then or what it says now or what it will say in the future because it changes as we learn more that nothing undermines the core truths of this is about who and this is about why. When we read it in that context, again, regardless of what particular view you fall into, when we read the scripture in that context and this account in that context, we should see that there isn't actually any conflict between faith and science. That that they're not in competition with one another, that faith and science actually complement one another. Because as we dive into science, we discover things about the physical world that we believe God created. And we're able to look into a microscope and look into a telescope and like, oh my gosh, God, that's how you did it? You're awesome! You're awesome! This is incredible. But then there will always be things that science can't answer. As much as we poke and prod and discover, there'll still be these massive questions that we have. In fact, by the definition of what science is and who God is, the the two can never cancel each other out. Because science, the definition of science is the study of the physical and natural world. But God, by his nature and definition, is a supernatural being, meaning he exists outside of what's natural. He's spaceless, immaterial, timeless. And so we don't need to, listen, if you're a Christian, you don't ever need to be threatened by something in a science book or by a video that you saw or some, a question that someone asks you. That, that what it should do is make us go, huh, I don't know, I've not thought about that. Let me look into that a little bit. Let me figure out what that actually says. And again, science explains so much about the physical world, and we should view that as a tool. We should be grateful for that, about the what of the world and the how and maybe the when, but it can never answer the why. why. Why is this here? Why am I here? Why is there something rather than nothing, right? Like those kind of philosophical deep, like what about right and wrong and why is there this thing within me? It's like sometimes I don't even have to be taught that. I just know what right and wrong is. Like what is, what is with that? And science with all of its advancements has never been able to explain nor provide a solution to the human problem the problem of the human heart and human evil. Like with all of the studying we've done, we've never been able to definitively say, okay, this is why we're so messed up. Now we know why people like rape and kill and burn and pillage and exert power over each other. We have an answer. We've never been able to come to that answer. And we've never been able to come to a solution for it. Again, as as great as scientific advancement is, it's not solved the problem of the human heart. In fact, because science is simply a tool, when you involve the human heart, it becomes a tool that can unleash untold destruction because we can take that and do terrible acts of evil. I'm a person that I really enjoy history. Most of you know that about me. Man, I can't say specifically today. Specifically the 20th century. And there was so much advancement, you know, scientific advancement at the end of the 19th century, into the 20th century, and there was this thinking of we've done it, right? Like we figured it out, we've cracked the code. Like utopia is on the way, woo! And then, you know, like... Spanish flu and World War I and World War II and a Great Depression and like genocide. And it's like, what just happened? 
We unleash science in many areas to just kill people by the millions. And so while science is great and it, it, it enriches our lives and we learn many things from it, it can't tell us why the human heart is how it is or what the solution is to that. See, that's where the scripture comes in and that's where the gospel comes in. That's where Christianity can say, we have an answer for that. Because we look to this original story of Genesis and we say, hey, we see who this God is and what things were supposed to be like. We see a creation that was, that was born out of beauty and goodness with a desire for humans to flourish and there to be plenty for everyone, but something went wrong. And so you flip the page to Genesis 3 and you see God's intent and then you see humanity giving him the collective middle finger and saying, we want to do it our own way. We want to be our own kings and our own rulers. And in that moment, sin and death and evil come into the world and the creation has been infected with it ever since. And so we hate and we kill and we steal and we hold power over and there's sickness and there's disease and there's death and there's all these things. And we're like, what is wrong and in Genesis 3, when the fallout, when the fall happens and the fallout begins and God begins to talk about like, hey, here what, here's what's going to happen because you've brought this into my good creation. He looks at Eve and he says this line that is a foreshadowing of him saying, I'm putting the solution, like I'm getting the ball rolling on that already. And he looks at her and says, You're gonna, there's going to be one who comes from you, like the, the offspring of, of a human. A human one will come and crush the head of the snake that the snake crusher will come. The one will come who will, who will kill sin and evil and death and destruction at its source. And 2,000 years ago, Jesus showed up on the planet, the God-man, the God who is spaceless, timeless, and immaterial, steps into a specific space and time and history, becomes a physical human, and lives the perfect life and shows, hey, this is actually how humans were meant to live. I'm going to show you what it's supposed to be like, and because you haven't been able to do that and you can't do that, and you're carrying all the weight of that sin and that shame that leads to death, I will go to a cross and pay for that for you so that you can have a path forward. And I will rise from the dead, defeating the power of death. The gospel comes along and says through the death, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, that he has defeated sin, he's defeated evil, he's defeated death, he is redeeming all things back to himself, and he will finish that work. That Jesus is the answer to the human problem that we, for all of our efforts, have not been able to solve. But there's this sin and evil issue at the heart of every human, and it infects the world around us, and he's like, I'm here to deal with that. And so the question really is, as we, as we struggle with and wrestle with faith and science, and we have a lot of really interesting conversations. The question isn't, how do faith and science work together? That's a fun question, and we could talk about that for the rest of our lives. And it will be awesome, and I love those kind of conversations. But the real question is, the real question that gets to the heart of what's wrong and is there any hope for the future? The real question is, who is Jesus? That's what the question always has been. Who do you say he is? Is he who he claims to be? And if he is, have you trusted him? Scripture tells us that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, that is he's the king, putting him back on the throne, I'm not the final authority over my own life, that he is Lord. If we, if we confess that with our mouths, we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, that we will be saved. Free from sin, free from evil, free from death, that we'll have healing, we'll have hope, we'll have life, we'll have a future. And that is an offer that is on the table to anyone anytime, anywhere, here this morning, at home this week, no matter what your views on science are, everyone can trust and follow Jesus. And that is the deepest human need that we have. So do the, the Bible and science conflict with each other? I would argue no, that they complement each other. Next week, we're going to talk about what do we do with the violence that we see in the Bible, specifically in the Old Testament. So I hope you can join us for that. Let me pray for us. Lord, we thank you for who you are. God, we, we thank you for what has been revealed in your word about the, the nature of this world that we live in, uh, the beauty that we see in your creation. God, I pray that as we read these passages and we have interesting conversations and dialogues and disagreements that we would not forget the primary message behind it, that the creation and the creation narrative is revealing to us who you are. It's revealing to us the kind of God you are, the love that you have for us. And God, even when we've rejected that and gone our own way, we see that, that you have made a way for us to get back to you. You've sent your son, Jesus, to show us how to live and how to love, how to love you, how to love our neighbors. He's paid the price for our sins and rose from the dead. God, I pray we would just make that primary in our lives, that that would be our primary focus, that we would live as people who give everything to you every second of every day. We just ask this in Jesus' name, amen.